going down everybody welcome to wine talk with tesh uh a couple of shout outs real quick welcome welcome everyone i'll give everyone a chance especially on instagram i know you can't join in on instagram like you can on facebook because we go live on facebook and on youtube a few minutes before the actual event so uh, we'll give everyone a chance on instagram i see you baby uh to jump on if they want to jump on and participate uh so while we give everybody a chance to tune in uh a quick shout out to jordan behind the camera uh thanks for making everything way doper than i can um you the man appreciate it uh That's if you guys everyone. aren't if you aren't following jordan already uh go follow jordan jordan uh give him give him your handles uh instagram is uh jordan stefan underscore um here I'll, I'll just i'll type it in the chat that'll be easier because okay, no one can ever figure out how to spell my last name perfect <laughs> all right there you go so the uh, it'll pop up there in the chat on all of the platforms uh except on instagram it will pop up jordan let's jordan stefan underscore what on instagram it's it's jordan stefan underscore everywhere else it's just jordan stefan at jordan stefan on okay, twitter cool. YouTube, so everywhere. on instagram jordan stefan underscore uh and then on uh on everything else uh it's jordan stefan j-o-r-d-a-n-s-t-e-f-f-e-n don't make me spell that 10 times fast <laughs> uh <laughs> go follow jordan he's dope he does dope shit yeah do you hey are you actually are you the one who's in charge for uh for we are fluid concepts for that instagram account um we we all do stuff on there but okay um, cool yeah all right cool so go follow uh we are fluid concepts as well because they they do dope shit so uh it's march we're in spain this month at least i want to be in spain today was awful here with the rain and the hail um if you guys uh already had the dinner uh, if you guys actually went and got the pollo asado and you made it and you served it on top of uh, the cilantro rice, um, I hope you enjoyed that meal as much as I do. I love that dish and I think it's perfect for both of these wines. Um, if I'm being particular, I think James actually said this. Uh, he liked it better with the Maruxa too. Uh, I think the Godeo just smacks with, this, with that dish, but it works with the red too. It does work. So yeah. Uh, Auntie Nora is in the house, and oh snap! Uh, oh yeah, yeah, we know Christy's in the house. Uh, I made a snowball and threw it. All right, cool. Made your own pollo asado, of course you did. You hella bougie. Everybody likes to say I'm bougie. Uh, Diana is bougie, but she's great, uh, and I bet that pollo asado was really good. Uh, if you guys have not already done so, we are in Spain, so I'm gonna talk a little about where we're going to be in Spain. So Jordan's gonna throw up the map. Um, and I want you to look at the top left of this map. Okay. I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of guide you in where we're at. So we're in Galicia. Okay. And then specifically on like the, from that top left corner of the map, we're going to be inside of Galicia. And then more specifically, we're going to be in a region called Val de Oras, um, for the first one. And so we're fairly close to the coast. We're fairly close to the ocean. Um, and, uh, that kind of gives you an idea of why this Godeo is going to taste the way it does. Then for the second wine, we're going to be heading east from that location. Now we're going to be going over to Rioja. So if you're following that map, look for La, La Rioja on the map. Um, Madrid, first of all, let's get to Madrid is like smack dab in the middle of Spain, right? Uh, so if you look at Madrid smack dab in the middle, you go up and you go to the right just a little bit. There's Rioja, ta-da! And not too far from Rioja is the Pyrenees Mountains, which separates it from uh, the next country. So anyhow, uh, a little geography, probably a little too much. But that's where we're going to be in the world. So we're kind of in the northern half of Spain uh, for this particular for these particular wines. Uh, and um, we'll kind of bounce around a little bit on the next tasting as well. Um, both of these regions, I think, make phenomenal wines. And uh, if you have not had the pleasure of having some of these varietals before, I think you're in for a treat because they, uh, they, they fucking smack, guys. <laughs> They're really good. Um, so if you, if you have your wine, pour yourself the Maruxa Godeo, uh, and we'll get into it. Um, the two L's is, is a Y sound. So a lot of people uh, will mistakenly call this Godello. It's, it's actually pronounced Godeo. 
uh, that's, I just did a really obnoxious psalm thing where like, it's actually pronounced Godeo, but it, it is, it's pronounced Godeo. <laughs> um, but it, it pour yourself a glass and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the winery itself is not, is not Maruxa. The, that's what they call the wine. Um, but uh, for simplicity reasons on the website, like I refer to it as uh, Maruxa. So that is the label, uh, but the winery itself is called Virgen de Galir. Uh, and it's a fairly young winery. They've only been around since 2002. Um, they're located in a small village inside of uh, Galicia called Entoma. Uh, and uh, specifically that Entoma, the village, is a part of a, a bigger uh, region, wine region known as Val de Ores, like I mentioned before, and it's also what's on the label. So you guys often ask about the label and what's going on there. This one's fairly simple. Uh, the picture on the label that also kind of ties in with the name of the wine. Um, it is representative of uh, the winery founder's uh, mother, whose name uh, uh, is translated to Mary. So Marexa Mary, um, that's that's a little tribute to mom. So yeah, uh, I'm glad you like Spain, girl. Bre my, my friend Veronica is here. I'm very excited that Veronica is here. Um, Oh, you have three bottles that are marked 24th? Is the thing, no, uh, open the Maruxa Godeo and then uh, open the uh, Ialba. The one that says, uh, it's got the pretty flowers. So open up the one that looks like that and open up the one that looks like that. Um, the Godeo, I wouldn't drink room temp. Um, uh, on the bare minimum, I would drink the Godeo. Uh, at cellar temp, but you know, um, if you want to chill it down more, you can. Um, I'm a, I'm a personally like I'm a fan of, um, of of drinking the wines a little bit warmer than than most people do. A lot of people like to drink their white wines like ice cold, um, and I don't like them ice cold, uh, especially Godeo. I think it just shines a little bit more like near more near cellar temp. Um, same thing with the Maturana Tinta. I think it drinks perfect at like 58 degrees. Uh, whereas like a lot often you, you might uh, pull that wine and let it come up to room temp. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I, no, oh, I, I see you. Uh, yeah, I probably just accidentally put a 24th sticker on, on the third, on one of the bottles. So my bad, Lori, glad we got you caught up. Um, but yeah, today we're drinking those two wines. So, um, Mine is garage temp, perfect. Garage temp right now is perfect. It is, it is actually a really good temperature. Uh, on the next, I'm gonna tell you guys this now for everyone who's tuning in. On the next tasting, the Finca Nueva, drink that one a little bit more chilled. You'll want that, we will want that slightly more cool uh, than cellar temp or garage temp even. Um, this is the perfect time of the year to have, have wine in the garage. But you know, in Sacramento, it's gonna like be like a hundred degrees before we know it. Uh, and then we'll all start sweating profusely from, and the garage won't be as nice anymore. So yeah, um, so there's that. So if you guys aren't drinking already, I hope that you are, take a drink because that's what we're here to do. Here we go, Andrew, I love you, man. Uh, what kind of glass would I recommend for this wine? I would typically drink this out of a burgundy glass because um, I would liken it most uh, to like a Chardonnay, right? It's a little bit, um, I don't, I don't want to say like it is Chardonnay. It's not, there's no relationship, um, but I would liken it to that. Uh, and as such, I think that like a Bordeaux, uh, sorry, a Burgundy glass will really help the aromatics uh, come out and really uh, shine. Now, I don't own, I've mentioned this before. I don't own anything. I have, I have let me back up. I have two wine, nice wine glasses. I have a Gabriel glass and I have a Zalto. And tonight I happen to be drinking out of my Zalto, um, which is a stunning glass. I drink everything out of my Zalto, um, like everything, everything. Like I drink champagne out of my Zalto. Um, somebody asked me this about champagne flutes and they were like, it doesn't seem to really help the wine open up. And it's because champagne flutes kind of really don't help the wine open up, especially, especially sparkling wine. Like for me personally, when you're drinking champagne, like champagne, um, you need something that's going to have a little bit of a bigger 
uh, opening at the mouth so that way it can breathe. Like she, I'm a fan of champ champagne coupes, uh, but I, I would drink it out of this too. So um, you can drink Godeo out of, out of any glass, okay? I, I'm gonna say this, I'm snobby about glasses, but sometimes you have to work with what you have, right? That's just the reality of life. Um, I have also, I, I mean, I'm, I'm snobby about glasses to some extent, but you have to work with what you have. And then sometimes, sometimes you drink $500 bottles of wine out of red solo cups on a bus to San Francisco. I'm not saying I've done that. I'm just saying that like shit like that, it happens. You know what I mean? And um, sometimes, you know, you get off of a long night at work and you're parking lot pimping with your friends and you want to drink some bougie wine, but you know, you don't have anything. So you have uh, you know, you have your red solo cups and you rock your red solo cup. Sometimes that happens and that's okay. Um, but for this wine, I would recommend a burgundy glass. If you don't have a burgundy glass, any glass will suffice. So yeah. Um, what can I tell you guys about Godeo that you might not know? Okay, so Godeo as a varietal is native to Spain. Um, it's not, it's, it's becoming more and more popular now. But it's not necessarily, uh, I would say like even like 10, 15 years ago, it was not a popular grape because not very many producers were making it. It wasn't really until like, it, it, kind of, it almost faded out of production, um, but it wasn't until like the 1970s where a guy uh, with the last name Fernandez decided that he was going to like make this wine come back. Um, and so they started producing the varietal and doing an excellent job at it. And as a result, now, you know, in, in 2021, you can find Godeo. It's not incredibly difficult. Um, and the end result, I think, is absolutely beautiful. As a grape, you should also know a couple of things about it in terms of, um, in terms of like what it's related to. It has a sibling. The sibling grape to this is Verdejo. If you've ever had Verdejo, then you kind of know that they have some qualities in line, but you'll find that Godeo is a little bit bigger and a little bit uh, uh, bolder as, a comport, as compared to Verdejo. Uh, Starbucks cup on the way to Napa, it's what you do, baby. You know what I mean? Rinse that bad boy out and go to town. Let me know if you guys are already drinking, I wanna know what your, your thoughts on the wine are. Um, oh man, I love this wine. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking about it a little bit. This wine is all stainless steel, right? It's these no oak. Um, aromas, flavors, I'm gonna kind of combine them here. Green apples, I'm getting pear, lemon zest. The lemon zest is really prominent on the finish. Um, and then something like, There's like a very, very like soft note. I think it's more on the palate than on the nose. Of, uh, yeah, because I'm not really picking up. There's like a tropical note uh, that I can't quite put my finger on that's on the palate um, that I think is phenomenal. Um, and then of course, well, the one thing that I love about Godeo um, and why I would typically say like it pairs incredibly well, um, why it pairs incredibly well with things like, like on the, on the page, I think I said, you know, seafood or salmon, uh, it has salinity. It has so much salinity. And, and I just saw that you, you typed it in. Good looking out, Andrew. Uh, the bottle seem, the bottle seems small cause it's gone. <laughs> Somebody's having a good night. I'm glad to hear that. The <laughs> That's good. Good problems. I, I like hearing that salinity for sure. Salinity. It's got a ton of salinity. Um, and um, if you made the cilantro lime rice, I think that this uh, goes phenomenal with that. Um, but you know, I, I think that if you're just pairing this wine al alone, shellfish, uh, salmon. Uh, Ashley, Godeo and Albarino, they're grown proximity-wise, they're grown fairly close together, right? Um, but in terms of what the grapes uh, are consisted of and, and like, like parentage and all that, no relationship. Um, so uh, think of Godeo as its own thing and think of Albarino as its own thing because they're not related at all. If you, if you didn't catch it, the only thing that it, it does have a relationship to, it's a sibling to a Verdejo. Um, so yeah, so that's an interesting thing. 
Um, it is very bright, very fresh, very crisp. Some, oh, quince. Veronica coming through with the tasting notes. Quince. I like that call. Quince is a good call. Great. <laughs> I fucking love you guys. Oh my God. So <laughs> Diana said, is great with Lay's jalapeno kettle chips. I bet it is. I bet it, I bet it smacks with that. I bet it's bomb. Uh, anybody else having not the, the dish that I recommended? Is anybody uh, just drinking uh, and eating whatever? Because those are the ones that I'm always curious about. And I'm always curious about like what, what it's pairing with, like how it's doing with those things. Oh, hey, Nora, I don't see, uh, I don't see Ralph and Marianne. Uh, you should text them and tell them to jump on because I'm wondering what's going on. They, they, I know they made some food. Um, skin contact length of time. Uh, I don't know uh, how long this saw skin contact. Uh, it definitely has weight, but I think it has more to do not with the skin contact, uh, but, with the, um, but with the actual varietal. Um, so yeah. Trixadura is also often grown in the same region. Who made some food? What the hell? That was the creepiest little whisper. <laughs> Jordan, was that, you? <laughs> that was you on Instagram Live coming through from another dimension. Oh, that was so funny. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Uh, least time. I don't know about the least time. Um, because uh, the, their text sheet didn't say, but if I'm, if I'm basing it off of what I'm tasting, uh, I do, I can tell you that the Godeo grape itself, the varietal itself is very high acid. Uh, so I would imagine that it went through a little bit of uh, ML and I would imagine that at some point during that time frame, they did do some lease uh, stirring to give it a little bit of texture and soften it up even more so because it's, it's round, right? Like it's not super high acid, so crisp. Um, to where it's like ripping your teeth off with the acidity. It has some richness to it. Uh, so yeah. Uh, David, you're wrong, man. I think it goes really well with the rice. <laughs> but okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, well, I, I appreciate, you know, your, your perspective on it. So yeah. If you made, uh, let's see, Bruna Girl just drinking. Uh, you know, I'm on the second one and it's almost gone. That's great. I'm really glad to hear that. That Maturana Tinta is a very interesting wine and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, if you made pasta, beef, and tomato sauce, um, it probably won't pair well with the Godeo, just being, being 100. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's not bad, but uh, if, you, if you guys are gonna open the Maturana Tinta, which I think you should, uh, especially with dinner, if you're still eating, that will be amazing with it. That will be really, really good. You burn the rice? Oh, man. Oh, Ralph, you got the kids? Oh, man. I got to tell you guys, I'll, tell you, I'll share this quick story with you, right? So, like, we all talk about, like, you know, how hard it is to, like, be at home and, uh, like, all the time. First of all, I ripped another pair of motherfucking pants today, okay? I'm not happy about this. COVID has not been kind to my big-ass body. I'm already a big dude. Uh, clearly I need to fucking work out on the regular. Um, but secondly, one of the things that, uh, that's happening right now is, uh, is my, my, my kid, my son in particular, he, every time I have a tasting appointment in the warehouse, which is my garage, he, he needs to be out there with me. And it's for no other reason than he wants me to hold him during that time. And he will scream and like throw shit. And I am going to blame COVID, motherfucker. What the <laughs> I, I, hang on. You, you clearly stopped me in my tracks. I am going to blame COVID. Uh, because at least before I was out and about and I was walking around and I was doing shit. But like now it's just like, you know, I work from home. Like I work from home. I sit in front of my computer. I, you know, I have tasting appointments, but I don't go anywhere. Um, anyhow. My, my son, he will, he just wants to cry and scream and, uh, and it's been challenging. So that, that whole front has not been fun. Um, we had the red with dinner and thought it paired really well. I had a little too much fun with plating. That plating looked good. I shared it on Instagram. Uh, it looked really, really good. 
maybe I made the rice wrong. I just, I thought I'd just change the flavor of the wine compared to with the chicken. That's all right. I mean, no, no, I don't think. Did you make a cilantro lime rice? I'm curious. I mean, what, you know, what, what direction did you go with the rice? Um, but it shouldn't have, the cilantro lime shouldn't be so like, uh, shouldn't be so like, shouldn't be so dominant. It should be like a real subtle flavor. I mean, it's rice, right? Um, but if you are pairing uh, the two together, I think that the, the, the lime rice part, the cilantro lime rice part is the part that makes the pairing with the maruxa shine. And then I think that the chicken piece is what really makes the uh, Ialba shine. But that's just my two cents. Tell me what your guys' perspective on it was. Uh, obviously, uh, David, you thought that um, you you thought that uh, that the lime rice was a little too overpowering for the wine. Um, I need to involve him in the wine selling. Uh, it's hard. To, I mean, maybe when he's older, man, he's uh, like kind of overpowered this lunch. Oh, bummer. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, bummer. Did it work? Did you try it with the red? Um, can I talk about how white wines open up the same way red wines do? Uh, not exactly the same, but they do open up. They do open up. Uh, white wines do open up. Um, I've had people ask me to decant white wine in the kitchen. Um, and sometimes I just thought they were bonkers. But like, if it's like a vintage Chardonnay, um, even more so, like you really get an idea of like how uh, much that wine can open up, right? Um, and and yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, the ethanol in there, right, is really gonna, it, it's, it, it, the ethanol is going to evaporate and that's gonna carry with it aromas. And as it opens up, as that ethanol continues to evaporate, evaporate out of your glass, that's why, that's why wine people are like, we're not, do, we're not doing this to be obnoxious. Okay, maybe some of us are, um, but uh, everybody's looking at me like some of us, huh, Dash? Uh, it, it, the, the opening up of the wine, this helps evaporate the ethanol in the glass, right? And, at, and with that, it carries those aromas and everything. So, so yeah, I mean, it is going to open up and it is going to be different. So if you don't finish this bottle, uh, what up, Vinny? Um, if you don't finish this bottle, uh, like right this second, hang on to it and leave it, up, leave it open and then come back to it after you drink some red. So yeah. If I need to blast chill in a bucket, what, I'm sorry, that's coming out of where, oh, oh, if I, yeah, oh, the, the decanting thing. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes people bring in their wines. Hi, Carrie, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys. Um, sometimes people will bring in their wines to restaurants and uh, they'll bring them not prepared at all. Um, so a good example would be, a good example would be, Christy, I'm gonna to get to that in one second. The short answer, yes, they do. Um, but uh, people will bring like a bottle of bubbles, like room temp to a restaurant and be like, serve this to me. And you're like, well, it's room temp, so it's not gonna be good. And you're, we're gonna lose a lot of bubbles just from opening it at room temp because uh, that atmospheric pressure increases as the, with the temperature. So that cork's gonna come flying out as soon as you take that cage off the warmer that, that bottle of bubbles is. Uh, so you obviously wouldn't take a bottle of bubbles and pour it into a decanter, but sometimes people will bring like a Sau Blanc or, or a Chardonnay and then want it to be much cooler than it is. And uh, a quick way to do that is to pour it into decanter and then you put that decanter carefully into ice uh, or an ice bath. And that helps cool down that wine a little bit faster because the glass uh, bottle is gonna be a lot thicker than uh, the glass decanter is. So it's going to help uh, regulate that temperature a little bit. So yeah. Um, why, yes, white wines do have terroir. There is a sense of place. Um, soil matters. So, it, you know, um, a lot like chalk, um, limestone, um, the other wine that we're going to be drinking, the Vina and Ialba, that comes from like schist. Um, type soil and and yeah, it absolutely matters in white wine uh, and in red wine. Um, so you definitely get a sense of place. And actually, I'm going to talk about that uh, with the with the next wine. So if you guys have the red, pour yourself the red, and we're going to move on. So uh, the 16 Vigna Ialba 
I always hold up the bottle. I'm going to talk about this like every episode, I feel like. <laughs> um, the um, the Vigna y Alba is a really cool project. Um, it was founded by the Ruiz family all the way back in uh, 1975. And, um, and they, as a producer, their, their main goal was to revive varietals that uh, other people uh, aren't really messing with at that time, like very like minority type of varietals. Can't see the bottle. Oh, Vinny, I'm sorry, bro. Hang on. You're on Instagram and on Instagram, boop, there you go. Vinia Yalba uh, Rioja. This is Matudana Tinta is the name of the grape. Um, Sorry, if you guys ever, if you guys are on Instagram, if you want to switch over to Facebook and on YouTube, you get like the full blown show. Uh, Instagram doesn't tie in with everything else. So uh, there's graphics, there's maps, you know, I got like a scroll on the bottom. Jordan does all kinds of dope shit uh, on, uh, on uh, Facebook and on YouTube for me. So yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, where is that? Oh, in addition to producing Maturana Tinta, which is already a unique varietal. They also produce Tempranillo Blanco, Maturana Blanco, and Graciano. Now Graciano, I would argue, is, is a minority grape, but like it's it's in Spain, man. It's all over the place. People use it for blending purposes fairly regularly. So they call it a minority varietal, but uh, I mean, you're not finding Graciano like 100% on its own, uh, but they do make that. That's one of their varietal selections. So it's cool for that reason. And you guys need to pardon me for one second because my TV just turned on like totally randomly, freakishly. And I'm gonna step away to turn that off so you guys aren't bothered by it. One sec. I think what happened is that my kids have, uh, they're in the room and they have devices right now. So they stay calm and, and chill. Uh, I think what happens is they, uh, they put the feet up onto, <laughs> onto uh, my big TV screen in the living room. So it's just like, like ooh, okay. Or I best. smell dill, Kyle smells pomegranate. Those are both very good calls. I get jalapeno on the nose. I like those calls, those are good calls. I just popped open my bottle and I think it might be slightly corked. Um, nope, maybe not, it's blown off a little bit. Um, I haven't had Bacchus's Graciano, but I'm glad to hear that it's it's good. So, um, where was I at? Sorry, stupid TV. Uh, Maturana Tinta was losing its hold in Spain back in the day. Because uh, it's been there for quite a while. Uh, I want to say since like the mid 1500s, the grape has been around. Um, it was losing its hold in Spain until 1975 when Vigna Yalba was like, hey, we're going to we're going to produce this and we're going to make it 100 percent varietal. Boom. Here you go. Um, what I think Spain maybe didn't realize at the time is the grape is also it's. It is true. So um, th that's it's the same grape. So um, if you guys are not familiar with Trousseau, Trousseau has been shining in the Jura region of France where we were last month um, forever, since like the 1700s. It's been there for a long time. And they've been producing it there for a long time. Um, now, we, we talked about terroir, and I'm gonna talk about the grape itself here a little bit more in just a second. But when we talk about, um, when we talk about terroir, um, being important to white wine, obviously like just as important in the red wine. And here's a really good example of a wine that shines totally different from, if you've ever had Trousseau from France, um, you know that it's like a fairly light and elegant wine. Um, it has some bigger, bolder fruit qualities to it. But like if you've had Trousseau from France, it's not that it is not that uh, strong of a wine, but here 
we talk about the difference that the soil has on the wine, this is insane. This is incredibly different uh, and it's bigger um, than, than its counterpart from a different part of the world. Um, so no, my wine is corked. I can't drink it. I'm sorry. All I can smell is uh, like uh, wet cardboard. So that sucks, but that's okay. Hopefully none of your wine is corked. Um, it shouldn't be, you know, that cork, let's talk about cork wine real quick. Cause I can't drink mine. Um, it's, it, it happens a lot more than people realize. Um, I will say that but a lot more wine is cork than people probably, uh, pay attention to, or even notice. Um, but if you get like this wet cardboard smell or like rotten eggs, almost, um, that's kind of like the telltale sign that the wine is corked and the cork has failed to preserve the wine and keep air out properly. Um, so yeah, um, I'm glad to hear that uh, the, there's a little bit of a charcoal element, cool. Ours is okay, cool, perfect. Uh, this is going to be one of my favorites. Woo woo, Marianne, I love it. Scan the QR code on the back and get some more because I have some more in stock. Um, the someone said dill dill is a great call so the overall incidence okay so i don't know if this is true the overall incidence of corked wine i have heard the statistic uh that one in every 12 bottles is corked but i don't know that that has been my experience what's up chad uh thanks for tuning in bro uh, that hasn't been my experience. And maybe it's because I drink, um, well, I mean, we all drink, right? We, we all drink fairly high quality producers, uh, small producers who give a damn about what they, what they do uh, with their wines. So um, did you say, is that two to 4%? I would say, I would say that's probably been my experience too. They say that that the uh, that it's higher than that. That like uh, there's a lot more corked wine out there than than we realize. Um, but I would say my experience is probably in that range, maybe five percent. Uh, I I couldn't put a number on it, uh, like a percentage. But I taste a lot of wine. But when you when you run into it, you run into it. Um, good. I'm glad to hear that yours is not corked either. Oh snap! What up, cuz? Oh, I got Chanel in the house. Now you know it's real. Uh, I appreciate all you guys tuning in, man. That's dope. Um, I would say, hey, man, Andrew said that was his experience in the restaurants, like 2 to 4%. I would say it was probably mine, too. Um, you know, you run into it, like, one every, like, it, one every, like, two to three weeks, like a, bo a bottle every two to three weeks in a restaurant where you're, like, cranking wine. Um, so it does happen. I mean, mine is definitely corked. It's not getting any better and it's actually getting worse as it sits there and just kind of mellows out. It's starting to smell more and more like that wet cardboard thing. Um, so yeah, that's a bummer, but it happens, right? These things happen. So uh, that's okay because I've drank the wine before and I've already had all the dishes. Uh, so I kind of know what direction to go here uh, in terms of uh, the tasting notes and stuff. Um, I said I wanted to talk about the grape a little bit more. So here's what you need to know about the grape. Um, it happens, right? Oh, hang on, time out. Uh, good reps take them with no issues. It's easy, bad reps make it your problem, 100%. Um, when you're in the wine world, when you uh, run into a corked bottle, um, you can send it back. <laughs> like, uh, as a matter of fact, if, you, if you're a guest and you're running, you're like, hey, this is corked send that shit back, get a, get a fresh bottle. Um, the restaurant has a way to get that bottle replaced. So if that, by the way, if you guys ever buy a bottle from me and you're like, hey, this bottle is corked, let me know. I will do my best to get it replaced for you, right? Uh, Cause I have wine reps now that I can work with who might be able to help me out with that. Um, so that does happen. Good, good reps will take them back. Um, Time to open a new bottle. You already finished the two? Damn, good for you. Um, where was I at? Um, Tinta losing its hold in Spain, made a comeback. Oh, I was gonna talk about the grape. 
Sibling grapes. So, uh, so it's kind of cool. Uh, there's this phenomenal book called uh, Wine Grapes. That's all it's called, Wine Grapes. Uh, and uh, Jancis Robin, uh, Judy something, I can't remember her last name. Um, a few ladies got together, wrote this phenomenal book that talks about like the parenthood of grapes and the, and the ancestry of grapes. Um, so Trousseau or Matodana Tinta, as it's also known in, in our glasses, uh, has two sibling grapes. It is a sibling to Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, there is a uh, parent grape. So this is actually kind of funny. They know one of the parent grapes is Sauvignon, uh, which is a varietal that's common in the Jura region of France, but they don't know what the other grape is. Um, so kind of funny in that sense. This bottle spends 10 months in French oak. I don't know why I'm acting like I can't uh, drink anything else. By the way, if you guys ever run into cork wine and you smell this, taste it. And, and I'm going to taste it now because it's been a while since I've tasted a cork wine. It should be like fat and flabby and not at all appealing. The, the acidity is probably going to be all whack. Yeah, like the fruit just isn't there. It's flabby. It's not good. The acidity is not there. Um, God, I know I shouldn't have done that. That was really, really bad. Uh, <laughs> things that you should be tasting with this wine. Okay, the wine spends 10 months in French oak. You should be getting notes of blackberry, pepper, cocoa, blackcurrant. Feel free to add into the, into the comments what you guys are experiencing with this wine as well. Um, the tannins are soft. The wine is incredibly easy to drink. Um, pairings aside from tonight's dish with this particular wine, uh, warm stew, grilled tuna, I think would even work. I think grilled tuna would just be like a fun pairing, but warm stew for sure. And like, man, we're having these cold rainy days, uh, 100%. So Sauvignon is, yeah, uh, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lineage there. Um, that is correct. Yeah. Sauvignon is Sauvignon Blanc's mom. That is correct. Uh, so yeah, uh, which is crazy, right? So like this book is incredible. Um, if you ever wanna, like if you ever wanna like really geek out, the book is incredibly expensive, um, but it, it is for like a wine geek, it's perfect. It has charts in there. Um, it has charts in there that like will guide you through like what, what different grapes uh, come from what different grapes and like which two varietals were, were, uh, were breeded to produce this new varietal. And so it's quite interesting in that sense. Um, it needs time to open up in our posse's opinion. Uh, first of all, can we just talk about how your posse's on Broadway and that you just referred to your group as a posse? I love that. Uh, and yeah, this wine can open up for sure and it will open up for sure. Um, once I said jalapeno, that's all you can smell. That's funny. Uh, that was actually somebody else, but yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with that. So, um, phenomenal wines. If you guys, uh, well, I'm going to leave it open for one second. What are the questions you guys have about these wines or what are the questions you have about the wine world? How about Chopino? Uh, what about it? You have to be more specific, Christy. I don't know what you mean. Um, yeah, what, yeah, what about Chapino? Do you want to know? Um, oh, what do I think it would pair well? Do you mean the red or the white? Because I think that the white would be phenomenal with Chapino. Um, but let me know which one, yeah. I don't know which one you're talking about. So yeah. To drink this wine with. Uh, if you're drinking, if you're talking about the red, uh, which I, yeah, you are. Um, Chipino would probably work fairly well. I mean, it's like a stew, right? But it's so seafood driven. If you're making like a true Chipino, which is seafood driven, uh, I would do, I would do, uh, I would do the white one. I would actually do the, the Marexa Godeo. So um, you guys had ribeye. We opened ours an hour before we started. Dope. Good idea. I'm thinking anything spicy is delicious with either wine. I'm with that. I, and I, I do agree with that. Uh, ribeye medium rare. <laughs> Is there any other way? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I like my steaks medium though. So, but I do love occasion ribeye. Sarah, what up? 
No, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, what other questions do you guys have? I need more feedback here. Is there a reason why Spanish reds tend to be more parked? Uh, by, oh, more, I was like parked, uh, more oaked. Um, tradition, right? And, and let's just be honest, like those grapes, they, they need that time in the oak to like really kind of come to. Um, and uh, I, I think traditionally, right, these wines, uh, they're made to lay down. Like it's a lot of Spanish reds are made to lay down. Like uh, my friend Hillary, she, she's a huge uh, uh, Rioja lover, but she likes to drink, she likes to, she likes to drink those wines um, from like 1960. So she'll drink like 1960 Riojas and um, like that's her jam. But like traditionally in Rioja, that's not, an, that's not an unusual thing. They'll lay them down for a long time um, for you to be able to enjoy them at a later date. So like Grand Reservas are a really good example. Uh, ground reserves are a really good example, right? They age them for a minimum of, of, uh, of five years, right? 60 months. And, uh, and then they get released for us to consume, to buy the bottle. So very often you'll find it like five, six years behind where we're currently at, as they should be. Um, so, it, but a lot of people will drink those and be like, oh, these are really young. But, but like they've already been aged for five, six years. Well, the thing is, is that that bottle can lay down for another 25, 30 years. 50 years. Um, and as a result, right, uh, over time, the tradition mark mixed with what they want out of their wines, uh, which is longevity, that's why they tend to see a lot more oak. Um, so yeah. Uh, what gives it the dryness? Um, the conversion of sugar to alcohol, primarily, because um, there, there's going to be sweetness to uh, the grape juice, right? The free run juice is gonna have some sweetness to it. It has sugar in it. Then you add yeast, right? That's gonna convert it to alcohol, uh, specifically ethanol. And when that happens, uh, if there's no residual sugar left in the wine, there's going the wine is going to be dry. Um, so in the case of like uh, Riesling, um, they will, what up? Uh, in the case, and what's up, Unc? Uh, in the case of Riesling, um, they leave a lot of residual sugar behind in some, in some, of them, right? And uh, you're starting to see a lot more dry Riesling now. Um, but yeah, um, that, that's essentially what happens. How much sediment will those old bottles get? A lot, a lot. What happens to the chemical compounds, right? Uh, to the phenolic compounds inside of a wine as it lays down um, is the weight, they, they, they tend to get heavier. And so they fall to, so that's why when you're drinking, I can't lay down a bottle here, I'm gonna use this one. Um, oh, quick plug, this Fiano de uh, Avellino is coming soon to the website and it is, sorry, right there, boom. That one's coming soon tonight, if I can, if I can function later, probably not. Um, it's coming soon to the website, it's gonna be really good. So when you're laying down that bottle, right, and we tell, in like in the Psalm world, you, you tell them to, uh, you, we say to uh, lay the bottle down if you're storing it. Um, ideally, if you can have it at a small angle like that, so that way the sediment can build up right here, um, that's perfect, but uh, that's what happens. So uh, the phenolic compounds in the wine, they, get, they gain weight over time and then they can't, they can't mix into the wine as, as much as they once did. And as a result, the color intensity of the wine will decrease, right? And it falls down to the bottom because it's gained weight over time, those phenolic compounds. Um, and then that turns into sediment. So the longer you lay it down, uh, the more sediment there will be in the bottle. Uh, if you lay something down for a really long time and you are um, and you are going to open it up, you need to kind of be gentle with that bottle. Like you, you shouldn't be walking around shaking it and da, da, da. It's not gonna, the sediment is not gonna magically uh, become a part of the wine again. Um, it's just sediment that's gonna be in the bottle. So shaking it is not a good thing keep it as still as possible. Uh, we, I used to serve it out of a basket. Uh, they sell these really nice like bottle holder baskets that are like at the perfect angle. You set them down like this. You can cut the foil off, which also quick note, uh, if you guys are paying attention, stop cutting the foil off up top here, this top lip, 
because uh, there's metal, you know, from the foil itself, there's a little bit of metal on there. Uh, and when you pour the wine, you don't want to pour that into your glass. Um, cut underneath the bottom lip, okay? Cut underneath the bottom lip. Um, so anyway, so these baskets, you set them up into these baskets, these serving baskets, and I never have to like move the actual bottle. It literally sits in the basket in this one position, label up, I cut the foil, and I can just slowly pour one guest at a time. And, um, and the sediment will stay right here. So that was a really long answer to, uh, that was a really good question though. Cold stabilize your sediment late and white in the freezer, the longer the better. I've never cold stabilized my own wine. Uh, I've only ever uh, had a producer do it in dirt, you know, like in the production process. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, cold stabilization uh, is a process that, um, that uh, reduces tartaric acid or tartar, sorry, not tartar, it doesn't reduce tartaric acid, it reduces tartaric uh, crystals uh, or wine diamonds, some people call them. Uh, in your in your bottle, specifically your white wine. So yeah, um, I missed some questions here. Will the dryness fade if laid down? The dryness will not fade if you lay down the if you lay down the bottle. The color will fade. So the intensity of the original wine will definitely die down, and it'll start to become more garnet, more uh, more brown in color, maybe more orangey. Um, but uh, the dryness of the wine won't won't change. It'll still be dry. The one thing that, that I will say uh, is the acidity will go down over time. Um, not enough to where, uh, you know, especially if it's a good producer and depending on the varietal, the acidity is going to go down, but it's not enough to where you're not going to be able to appreciate the acidity that it, that it has still, um, but the acidity goes down too. I bet the Rioja would be great with the earthy mushroomy stuff. Maybe rabbit with some thick bacon draped on it. Damn, Thomas, you can make us dinner. Shit. I'm excited that, that vaccines are happening for the fact that it means that we can all hang out again soon. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, for real, dude, wine diamonds. Um, Puma Road Pinot update. Auntie Nora, I have emailed her three times and she has not gotten back to me, man. I don't know, dude. Uh, I really want that Pinot. Uh, but, you know, they don't want to sell it to me. They don't want to sell it to me. I don't know what to say. Um, I'll keep trying. I'll say that. I'll keep trying. So hopefully... Hopefully we can eventually make it happen because it is really, really good. Um, and I really want you guys to uh, experience it. Um, our chicken recipe had white vinegar in the recipe. How can vinegar in a dish alter the, vinegar in any dish is gonna alter the flavor of, of what you're experiencing. Um, but they do go together as long as the vinegar isn't like the, isn't like the all-star of the show. You know what I mean? Um, Chef Kelly, when I was at the kitchen, was really good about stuff like that because he would uh, he would play, you know, depending on the acidity of the wines that I was choosing and vice versa. Like he might add like an element of um, of uh, vinegar uh, or acid uh, to the dish in order to work well with the the wines. So it depends is the question. Sometimes it can be good. Sometimes it can be harmful. For this wine, did the, dan did the tannins come from the grape or the winemaking? Both. Uh, it spends 10 months in French oak, so you definitely get some tannin from oak. Only 10 months, so primarily I think what you're experiencing is going to be grape. Um, so yeah, and then uh, also, you know, they, they probably let it sit uh, with the skins and and seeds and everything, uh, maybe a little bit longer to increase that intensity of the color and the tannin. Uh, because you do get tannin from the, the skins themselves too. My favorite wines are made in the vineyard. That's like on every website ever for every winery ever, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> my favorite, every winery likes to say my, my, my favorite wines are made in the vineyard, it, but it is true. So I'm chuckling about it, but it, it, it is true, right? It, wines are made in the vineyard. People, we don't realize, right? So when you guys, when, when we're going to, you know, wherever we're going to like shop, right? We just think of wine as a commodity. It's just like a thing that we buy that's in a bottle, da, 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 da. People don't realize that like that vineyard had to be tended to, right? Somebody had to prune back those vines. Somebody had to go through and drop fruit. Somebody had to make sure that the cover crop was proper. If it was biodynamic, somebody had to make sure if that cow skull was buried in the right area with the urine in it. Like it, somebody had to do all this crazy shit for that bottle to hit your table. So, you know, one of the taglines that, that I've recently gotten into was, um, 
was uh, uh, life is short, drink wines that mean something to you. And I, I don't remember who I sent that to, but I was like, I wrote that out. I typed it out and I was like, dang, that's actually really good. So I added it to like all my invoices. Cause I just think it's, a, it's, it is like, I mean, we should care about, uh, we should care about, you know, the beverage as much as we care about the food. Um, because a lot of work goes into making that wine uh, in the vineyard to, to Andrew's point. Um, let's see, hang on, I'm getting backed up here. Tenons are in the stems and skins. Wine making also plays a big part. Boop, boop, dup. I love fondant. Is that bad? Is uh, impedant Montese for sediment. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Uh, how long would I keep this wine? I honestly think you could keep this wine for like five to 10 years. Um, I think it'll probably get better with, with uh, you know, I don't want to say it'll probably get better because I already love the wine as it is, but it's certainly a wine that you can lay down. Congratulations. We've re received a hundred messages today with Restream Chat. Uh, Jordan, we're coming up, man. Last time it took a while to get to that. Um, calcium tartrate, what the hell is that chat? Um, the, the, the chat is, uh, so we use a platform, um, we use a platform called Restream to send the video that the, Jordan and I meet over Zoom. And uh, Jordan then feeds that to Restream, which Restream then feeds that to, to Facebook and to YouTube. And hopefully, eventually, Instagram, but it, not yet. Um, yes, yes, urine. There's there's animal urine involved with biodynamic winemaking. Um, we've touched on that before. <laughs> it biodynamic winemaking is is bizarre, dude. Like you have to do some some weird stuff. Um, but yeah, wine diamonds, wine crystals. I've heard it called both. Uh, that's why I love that hippie Ted Lemon. Yep, he is a hippie, but he does phenomenal work. And, um, and you know, the, the vineyard stuff, it does matter. It does matter. Would, have, would be a cool anniversary gift to open in five to 10 years, for sure. There's a, there's a lot of wines that you could lay down for five to 10 years. This is just one example of one that I think, um, uh, that I think could lay down for, for five to 10 years. You know what I mean? Um, Speaking, of, and a good example of that would be, uh, today I tasted, um, uh, you guys have probably heard of it. It's, uh, well, maybe you haven't, I don't know. Um, uh, what's it called? Stone Street makes a Rockfall Vineyard Cabernet that comes off of the top of uh, uh, the hillside in Napa Valley. If you're driving through St. Helena on the right-hand side, you go up that hill near, near Howell Mountain and um, they make this amazing, amazing Cabernet. And I was able to taste one today. Um, I got to taste the 2012 vintage today, but they had the 2010 vintage available for purchase. So I bought a six pack. So that's coming soon to the website. So if you don't wanna lay down wines yourself, you don't have to. Um, I, I like sourcing wines that are cool and that are ready for you guys to drink. So. Um, I never want to say that you can't lay down a lot of these. Uh, I think that you can. Um, and I think that every Psalm in the world would argue that, you know, lay it down, drink it five years from now, drink it 10 years from now, drink it 50 years from now. Um, that's not realistic for a lot of people, right? Unless you're, you know, we're not all, we, don't, we all don't have wine cellars. Um, we all don't have an abundant amount of money to be able to purchase uh, super old school wines. Uh, that have been aged properly and in a proper cellar. Um, so uh, I am able to source some stuff sometimes. Uh, like for example, I just got a 98 Piper Heidzik rare champagne uh, in a Magnum uh, from one of my clients. And that was a super cool bottle of champagne um, that they're going to enjoy at their wedding. So yeah. Um, Calcium tartrate, calcified tartaric acid in the bottle barrel. Yep. Ill. Ill what? Neil, I don't know what we're hearing about. I'm getting black licorice and anise in the back end. Um, I wish I could comment on that, but mine just smells like like wet cardboard. Uh, so uh, I don't think that you're wrong if you're if you're getting it. You might be, you know, the, yeah, absolutely. The wine is still going to open up and it's still going to uh, to develop. Um, real quick, uh, Nick Mallon is in the house, everyone. Nick Mallon. Uh, can I touch on the difference between this red and what to expect next time with the other red? The other red is Tempranillo based and it also has, um, 
It also has other varietals that uh, that kind of beef it up in the in the final product. Um, so the other red is going to be a little bit more uh, robust um, than this is. And the other one is the one that I think you could, I said five to 10 years for this wine. The other one for sure you could lay down if you wanted to. Um, but uh, so yeah, expect it to be bigger and bolder um, and a little bit more intense. So can I, re can I recommend a good wine cellar for the common people? Uh, it depends on how much you want to. Common people need to treat themselves too. Okay. So, um, dude, go, go to Costco and don't buy their wines, buy your wines from me, but go to Costco and buy a wine fridge. Uh, you can shop for them online, uh, and they'll deliver it to you. Um, but I, I mean, I have a 300 bottle fridge. That's one of two. Um, and I got the, I got one of them, the newest one from, from Costco. And I would highly recommend that. Um, yeah. The, the wine cellar thing is tough, right? Because like it, it, some people don't want that much storage. Some people want like 180 bottles. Some people want, some people want a freaking room in their house. Uh, probably not common people, but, uh, but for us common people, I think like a 300 bottle fridge is more than ample space. Um, I think it, you could find one that probably holds like a hundred bottles and stuff and you should probably be set. And I do love me some rare too, Lisa. I'm kind of sad that the bottle is not for me and it is for one of my clients. Um, but it is a fantastic bottle nonetheless. So yeah. Uh, and I just got a message from Mr. Drew Garrison that they're opening that bottle of Gosset Champagne. So yeah, that means great news. So congratulations, uh, Caitlin. That means that she uh, should be celebrating and her and Drew are uh, about to open up a very, very nice bottle. Uh, what else do I have for you guys? If you loved the Maruxa Godeo, or if you love the Vigna Ialba, scan the QR code on the back of your bottle to order some more. It'll take you right to the website. Uh, on a quick note on the website, a couple of people have been telling me that they have had like, they've had like issues like trying to order on the mobile, uh, like from their phone. Um, I, if you guys can help me, if you run into issues like that, if you could take a screenshot and just text me what, what, what's happening, because uh, I, I need to be able to give my, um, I, Square and Weebly are, are the platforms that I use to run the website. Uh, and I need, um, I need more uh, concrete evidence to show them that like, hey, this is the experience that my users are having um, that's not working for them. So if you guys run into that, please, please let me know. Uh, what else I got? Uh, these two are in. Um, I have Pierre Germinet Champagne, Premier Cru Blanc de Blanc on the website now. Uh, that Fiano Diagolino will be on there. Um, what else is there? Some new stuff coming. There's a, a Hess family collection uh, called Lion Tamer, which is a Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa. That'll be hitting the website soon. Uh, Panthera Chardonnay is coming soon. Um, and I have... There's one more. Oh, I got a, a great deal, uh, which uh, you guys will see uh, on a Brunello de Montalcino, a 2015 vintage uh, by Silvio Nardi. And that, that's a fantastic one, um, if you like that style. Alicia Taste Nail Polish Remover. Tell Alicia to stop doing crack. Uh, <laughs> She's my cousin, y'all. I can say that. It's okay. And I'm glad you love Hess. All right. We have hit the hour mark. I think I'm going to call it a night. Unless you guys have more questions, uh, we will see you guys in two weeks. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about wine in the meantime or if you need help navigating the website. Do I have a theme for April? Perhaps. Uh, I'm still working on it. Uh, you guys will find out on the next uh, Tush Talk for sure. Um, I have, dude, uh, Andrew, yes, I'm glad that you love Brunella. And yes, I can have some, I can get some great Nebbiolo. Uh, there, I have one bottle of Curto Marco Barolo left on the webpage. Um, you should snag that up. It's the 15 vintage and it's effing delicious. And you, yeah, that's a bottle that you need to have in your life. Uh, I love you too. Thank you. I appreciate you tuning in. And you're the bomb, Aunt Nora. Good looking out.
And uh, Jordan, you're the bomb too. Now that I can see your pretty face. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for being here, everyone. And until two weeks, we will see you guys then. And uh, make sure you're drinking good wine. All right. Cheers, guys. Talk to you guys soon.